We were without internet from 11 in the morning until what ended up being around 8 o'clock at night. I'd be the first to go in an apocalypse. I just would not even know what to do. Chris is over here like, who needs internet anyway? Let's just be one with the land. And I'm like, frantic. I'm like, I can't do anything. Tune in to the Jessica Benson Show with CJ Hurt live every weekday at 8 a.m. on YouTube at Grind City Media and the official Grind City Media app. We know there's only one team you want to watch. And Valley Sports is the place to get your Grizzlies. Experience the comebacks, the buzzer beaters, the can't-miss Memphis made moments live. Valley Sports keeps the grind going before and after the game, too, with Pete, Brevin, Fish, and Chris on Grizzlies Live. Watch Grizzlies basketball all season long with Valley Sports and streaming on the Valley Sports app. Valley Sports, home of the only team you want to watch. Let's talk about some of the guys who get dunked on the most. Mel Turpin. There's a great clip on YouTube, kids. Go look this up, where Michael Jordan gets the ball in the post, spins around John Stockton and dunks. As he runs down the court, a fan in Utah says, hey, pick on someone your own size. The next time down, Michael Jordan comes down, seven foot tall Mel Turpin's under the basket, and Jordan just hammers on him. And as he runs down the court, he turns to the fan and says, was he big enough? IMHO with Lang Whitaker and me, Kelsey Wright Johnson, on YouTube at Grind City Media and the official Grind City Media app. App. This is an actual good shoe. Yeah, it looks like, like this a, is good a shoe. real good shoe. What yeah. you think about him, uh, KJ? She <laughs> likes Cheetos. Like Cheetos? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like Cheetos? You like Cheetos? Kids, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's what I mean. For kids, For one kids, thousand yeah. percent. Yeah, yeah. And honestly, if I was still playing basketball, I like I played in brightly colored shoes. I, I wore pink shoes a lot of the yeah. time or purple shoes. Like I like that. The Sneak Fest Show live Tuesdays at 2 p.m. on YouTube at Grind City Media and the official Grind City Media app. From the Bill Ford Tough Studio at FedEx Forum, it's the Gary Parrish Show, presented by Ortho South, on YouTube at Grind City Media and the official Grind City Media app. Now, here's your host, Gary Parrish. All right. My name is Gary Parrish. I'm speaking to you from Stanford, Connecticut. Been at Doyle back in Memphis, producing the program. Glad he's with me. Glad you're with me. Hope you're getting through the day best you can. And I hope you've really been this entire college basketball season looking forward to a possible UConn Purdue National Championship game because we never been closer to it than we are right now. Both programs that have operated at the tip top of the sport have made the 2024 Final Four. They're both big favorites in the national semifinals, barring a surprise. That's what we're getting a week from tonight. We'll talk basketball momentarily. First, though, quickly, let me set today's schedule for you. In the next segment, about 20 minutes, I'm going to be joined by Michael Ease. He, of course, hosts Sports Center for ESPN. I'll talk to Michael about. The men's final four, the women's final four. Mike Lee's going to join me in the next segment. When I finish talking to Mike, what I would usually do is take a break, come back, do five more things you need to know, at which point we're going to discuss my previously undiscussed stories. But today, probably just going to keep talking basketball because there's a lot going on. So after I get done with Mike, we'll talk more in the NCAA tournament, then we'll eventually do GP's carry out all today. So that's the rundown. we got a lot to get to, but I did want to Start with the NCAA tournament because after a fun weekend of basketball, the 2024 Final Four is set. UConn made it for a second straight year. NC State has made it for the first time since 1983. Purdue has made it for the first time since 1980. And Alabama has made it for the first time ever. Big East SEC, Big Ten ACC, four power conferences are represented. Uh, are represented. So on Saturday... In Glendale, Arizona, this is what we're going to get at 509 Central, Purdue versus NC State at 749 Central, UConn versus Alabama. It's two one seeds, a four seed, and an 11 seed. Big Bet Bennett, two questions for you. Do you approve of this Final Four, and do you see any way NC State and or Alabama can keep us from a UConn-Purdue title game? 
Uh, do I approve of this final four? Hmm. I would say, I, I mean, yeah, I like the, I, I'm going to always watch the final four. So yes. And you got some big brands. So yeah, I don't think, you know, they're calling NC state a Cinderella story. I don't know. I mean, that's still a, that's still a big school that's won a national championship before. So I like it, though. I like it, though. I, I want to see Purdue-UConn. To your, answer your second question, no. Neither of them have a chance. It's going to be Purdue-UConn in the national championship game, and I think that is very exciting. I believe it'll be Purdue-UConn in the championship game. I have believed it would be Purdue-UConn in the championship game since before the tournament even started. If you look at my um, initial bracket, it's got those two schools meeting in the title game. And now we're, as I mentioned, closer to it than ever, not just in terms of, you know, calendar time, but like in the likelihood that it'll happen. They both only need to win one more game to get there. And they're both big favorites in the national semifinals. Purdue, nine and a half point favorite over NC State. UConn, 11 and a half point favorite over Alabama. So I won't go so far as to say there's no way Alabama or NC State could disrupt where it appears we're headed because there's always a way in a 40 minute basketball game in a single elimination tournament. And though it does appear that Purdue um, would have a hard time losing to this team and that UConn would have a hard time losing to its opponent. The truth is, you know, I can remember a time when we thought UNLV was unbeatable and then Duke beat them. And we thought Kentucky in 2015 was unbeatable and Wisconsin beat them. And it's not like Purdue and UConn, though both great. It's not like either one of them is undefeated or actually quite literally undefeated. They both lost the season. UConn three times, Purdue four times. Now, UConn never at home, never on a neutral court. There's nothing but neutral courts left. So UConn has never lost a game like the game it would have to lose to prevent itself from being a back-to-back -back national champion. But, but UConn is beatable. Purdue is beatable. Neither one of them look like it right now relative to the competition. But crazy, crazier things have happened in NCAA tournaments. Crazier things have happened in Final Fours. I wouldn't rule anything out. But it does appear we are headed for Purdue-UConn, which will be great because, you know, the AP poll does 20 polls before the start of the NCAA tournament, a preseason and then 19 straight weeks. And in 12 of those 20 polls, the number one team was either UConn or Purdue. So. It, it, you know, I never want to eliminate Houston from this conversation. You have revisionist history because it wasn't just a two-team race all season. It was a three-team race. Mm -hmm. Houston was a part of it. But I really do believe the only thing that prevented Houston from getting to this point as well and having three one seeds in the Final Four is Jamal Shedd spraining his ankle yep. in that Sweet 16 game against Duke. Like, if that doesn't happen, I think Houston beats Duke. And then I think Houston beats NC State. And then I think Houston is in the final four. So I don't want to say we were always headed for Purdue UConn because it could have been Purdue Houston or UConn Houston. But those three teams, some combination of them um, should have always been the last two teams playing in this 2023-24 season. And now again, with Purdue UConn, both in the national semifinals, um, it appears we're, 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 we're headed that direction. The game of the weekend, I guess, at least for our purposes in the state of Tennessee, was Purdue Tennessee final score. Bowl of Makers 72, Tennessee 66. Oh, buddy, if you were hoping uh, the Zach Eady Dalton Connect National Player of the Year conversation to the extent that it even existed, and it really didn't, other than like, you know, on Tennessee message boards in the rest of the real world, everybody understood that thing had been wrapped up for a little while. But if you were to like hold out hope, like if you put on your orange shirt, well, hold out hope, well, maybe this will be the day that Dalton Connect shows the whole world he's really the best basketball player in, in the sport. Well, uh, that one, Zach Eady got 40 points, 16 rebounds, mm. and then a huge block in the final minute on Connect. Now, Dalton Connect was awesome. 14 to 31 from the field, 6 to 12 from three, 37 points, three rebounds. But if you needed a reminder uh, of who the best college basketball player is, you got it yesterday on America's Most Watched Network, and that was the seven foot four Purdue center who got 40 points, 16 rebounds, and only one foul. He only was called for one foul. Zero three-second calls, and I gather this is the thing that really drives Tennessee fans bananas. Bennett, try to be impartial if you can. Do Tennessee fans have a, a legitimate gripe here? 
that ah. Zach Eady is just being real big and real rough with everybody, and those officials, they won't ever call nothing on him. The reason I don't think so is because you've heard this all season from opposing teams when it comes to Purdue, that they don't get in foul trouble. And so I think that there's actually, that's actually, um, you, you know, you're assuming that the, the referees just are in favor of Purdue every game because they just don't get into foul trouble. I think that Zach, you know, Zach Eady's seven four, dude. <laughs> like it's he's gonna block a lot of shots. Um, he's well, gonna contest he, a lot of jumpers. Uh, so I, I just I think that there'd be some grand conspiracy uh, to say that uh, that yeah that Purdue got got a favorable whistle this entire season. It's just um, it, it felt like yesterday, like half of Twitter was watching Purdue and Zach Eady for the first time. Mm -hmm. Like, this is the way they play. This is the way he plays. This is what he does. This is the way it's officiated. Um, if you thought, like, if part of your strategy was, you know, I, I hope they call three seconds on Zach Eady a lot. Well, they don't call it. And I'm, I know you can find stuff on the Internet where, like, that looks like that's a lane violation. That looks like that should be a three-second call. But if you go into a college basketball game um, with the hope that suddenly – the game is going to be officiated different than it's been officiated all season. Well, that seems like uh, a poor strategy. And as it pertains to like the actual basketball stuff, you're exactly right. Purdue doesn't foul. Tennessee fouls a lot. So without even watching the game, even before it tips off, you can reasonably assume that Tennessee's going to be called for a lot more fouls than Purdue is. Just, just, I mean, just, uh, just based on nothing more than the data that's available, this is what's going to happen. And Tennessee is like, it, it's, it's interesting because when people around that program want to uh, compliment the strengths of it, what you'll hear often is, you know, defensive minded, really, really tough, really physical, you know, they'll really guard you. They're going to, you know, I, I think that the common phrase that gets thrown around all the time is it's like playing tackle football when you play Tennessee. Like that's the roughest team you're ever going to have to play. So then to come out and act like it's crazy that you're getting called for fouls. Well, like you were always, you were one of the, uh, the, the teams in the country that fouls more regularly than anybody else. So I just wasn't shocked by the way that played out and the real failing on Tennessee's side to the extent that there was one, because at, at the end of it, the, the truth is they just got beat by a better team with a better player. Mm -hmm. Like Tennessee was really good. And they had a great player, but they played a team that's better with a greater player. And so the result was a 72-66 loss. But if you're trying to nitpick it, like what could Tennessee have done differently? The, the key to playing Purdue isn't trying to stop Zach Eady. You hear a lot of that. I even hear a lot of it heading into this Final Four. Like what can NC State do to to stop Zach Eady or slow down Zach Eady. We've been having this conversation for two years. They, they, you know, it, there ain't no getting that done. He is an overwhelming presence on a college basketball court that is very difficult to deal with. You, he's bigger than you. He's stronger than you. Um, he's, he knows how to get where he wants to get. He you know, can play right through you. So when you foul him, it doesn't hurt him. Um, or bother him sometimes. He's just a, an awesome college basketball player. So I don't think any strategy, like if you spend too much time trying to figure out, well, how are we going to shut down Zach Eady? Like that's, that's a waste of time. People have been doing it for two years. Nobody can do it. The thing is you've got to make him work on the defensive end of the court. You've got to put him in ball screens, pull him away from the basket, make him guard smaller guys, all of the things they're going to do to him in the NBA that make it uncertain what kind of NBA player he's going to be, that's the kind of stuff you've got to try to do to him at the collegiate level. And Tennessee just never really did it. And they end up wasting, not wasting, but an all-time great performance from an all-time great ball like has to go down in history in a losing effort because – as great as Dark Connect was, Zach Eady was just a little bit better. But that's all you could ask for from an Elite Eight game on Sunday afternoon. Like you get Purdue, Tennessee, a one seed and a two seed, and you got the guys who will probably finish first and second in the National Player of the Year voting when all of that is tabulated. 
to be clear, Zach Eady will be one, Don Connect will be second, and it will not be close between them. You know, just because Don Connect might be the second best player in the country doesn't mean he's anywhere close to Zach Eady in a National Player of the Year race. Like, remember when Katie Ledecky, she's a swimmer, and we'd see her in the Olympics, and, uh, you know, she'd get the gold, and somebody would get the silver. Like, they'd hand it to some woman. She'd get the silver because she finished second. But she'd finish second like 50 yards behind Katie Ledecky. It's like, yeah, you were the first person other than her. Like, if we can't give the gold to her, I guess we'd give it to you. But just understand, you're nowhere close to her. That's what this National Player of the Year race was. Um, it was Zach Eady, one, Dalton Connect, two, and the gap between them, very, very big. But yesterday... They were really trading bucket for bucket, scoring in different ways. Obviously, they're vastly different players. But anytime you can get a one seed, a two seed in an Elite Eight game, and arguably the two best players in college basketball going back and forth, both of them going above 35 points, like that's all-time great stuff. When we're re-watching classic NCAA tournament games someday, like that's going to be one that that's in the rotation. And then, you know, ultimately, you know, with about – uh, a handful of minutes to go. It was totally up for grabs. And then Purdue just made more shots and got more stops down the stretch than Tennessee. So they go to the final four for the first time since 1980. And Tennessee is reduced to entering next season, still trying to get to the final four for the first time in school history. And I know Vol fans were frustrated. And I know it's disappointing because anytime you get that close, um, you know, you want to take that next step. Just so nobody will ever be able to say that's a program that's never been to a Final Four before. But broadly speaking, I think when you can get a little separation between what happened yesterday afternoon and, you know, a point in time where uh, the, the, the hurt has uh, been alleviated a little bit, you'll look back on this and recognize it for what it is if you're a Tennessee fan and that it's uh, one of the greatest seasons in UT basketball history. You know, Tennessee has only won 12 conference championships and it's – uh, men's basketball history and it got one this season you know had 11 before this it got one this season that's big time tennessee has only made two elite eights ever this is one of them so they got as far as they've ever been in the ncaa tournament this season tennessee hasn't had a top 10 nba draft pick since 1983 that was Dell ellis like don connect might change that this year so i don't want to say this is as good as it ever gets for the vols because um i wouldn't put a ceiling on a program that's got those kind of resources and that kind of history. But this is as good as it's ever been for the Vols. That's that's true. Um, and they just happen to be a really good team with a great player that ran into a, a better team with a better player. Like if the bracket unfolds differently, you know, you could get to a Final Four. Look at Duke's path. Duke played Vermont, James Madison, Houston without its best player, and then a double-digit seed NC State. That was Duke's path to a Final Four. They just couldn't take advantage of it. Had that been Tennessee's path to a Final Four, Tennessee perhaps gets to Arizona yeah. and is in the Final Four for the first time in history. But you don't get to pick your path. And outside of the path Illinois ran, which was running straight into UConn, you could reasonably argue that Tennessee ran into the next toughest thing, which was Zach Eady and Purdue. So it ended when it ended. But that's a good Tennessee season. That was a good Tennessee team. And I do think that Don Connect is going to be a really good, really good NBA player. How about this? And this is just, I think, to highlight how different the two sports are. It is not even a debate who the best college basketball player in the country is. That's Zach Eady. But if you want to then twist it and start talking about the NBA draft and, and who's going to be the better professional, I think nine out of ten people would probably lean toward Dalton Connect. He, uh, you know, I know because the Grizzlies are going to be picking in the top ten, there's a, a lot of focus on this draft. And Donovan Klingon has been popping and Grizz Twitter, and I guess Dalton Connect starts to pop as well. I'd be happy if they ended up with either one of them. I, I think Klingon is going to be a terrific um, center uh, in the NBA. I don't know if you want to rely on him as a rookie to try to win a Western Conference. That's a discussion the front office would have to have. But the Grizzlies are going to be picking in a range where Dalton Connect is going to be a, an option, perhaps. And Donovan Klingon is going to be an option, perhaps. And we got to watch both of those guys this weekend and uh, one won, one loss, but they were both tremendous efforts from two possible, if not likely, uh, top 10 picks that uh, might end up inside FedEx Forum at some point in the coming months uh, working out for a Grizzlies front office that's 
going to have a lottery pick uh, if they decide to use it. We come back, turn our attention to Michael Leaves. He's a Sports Center host at ESPN. I'll get his thoughts on this Final Four and tonight's big game on the women's side between Iowa and LSU. It's the Gary Paris Show. We're presented by Ortho South. Justin Timberlake. The Forget Tomorrow World Tour. Live in Memphis. Justin Timberlake. FedEx Forum, Saturday, November 23rd. Get tickets this Thursday at 10 a.m. at LiveNation.com. The brand new single, Selfish, is available to stream and download now. For more, hit up JustinTimberlake.com. Real country music with Cody Johnson live Saturday, April 13th at FedEx Forum. Country's best. The Leather Tour with Cody Johnson with special guest Justin Moore. Also featuring Drake Milligan. VIP and reserve seats on sale at Ticketmaster.com in the FedEx Forum box office. Cody Johnson. Don't worry, be fluffy world tour. The minute you get into a brand new relationship, like magic, you know who really notices just how happy you are, guys? Other women, not your woman. Look how happy he is. <gasps> I bet I can change that. Friday, May 10th, FedEx Forum. Get your tickets now at fluffyguy.com. Don't miss a Memphis. Don't worry, be fluffy world tour. We know there's only one team you want to watch, and Bally Sports is the place to get your Grizzlies. Experience the comebacks, the buzzer beaters, the can't-miss Memphis-made moments live. Bally Sports keeps the grind going before and after the game, too, with Pete, Brevin, Fish, and Chris on Grizzlies Live. Watch Grizzlies basketball all season long with Bally Sports and streaming on the Bally Sports app. Bally Sports, home of the only team you want to watch. Nate Barkanti, the Be Funny Tour. I mean, Chuck E. Cheese is rough. I don't know if you've been there in a while. They look like they're trying to go to business and they can't. All new material. They filed for bankruptcy and they're still open. <laughs> they call Blockbuster and they're like, how do you get out? We want out. Nate Barkanti, Friday, May 31st, FedEx Forum. Tickets available at FedEx Forum Box Office or Ticketmaster.com. Produced by Outback Presents, Nate Barkanti, the Be Funny Tour. Show presented by Ortho South. I am in Stamford, Connecticut for the day. Ben Doyle back in Memphis producing the program. And I'm now joined by Sports Center host ESPN. It's the great Michael Eaves. Michael Eaves, it's GP. How you doing on this Monday? I can't hear him. I don't know if he's muted or. That was my fault. That was my I fault. I got it. Oh, uh, good. Hey, it, there ain't nobody ever saying... been on a Zoom who hasn't done exactly that. I was saying you're there in Stanford, Connecticut. That's not that far from Bristol, man. You should just get the full sports television experience while you're up in New England. Hey, I, I was going to – I meant to look this up, and I forgot. You might know the answer. Obviously, there's a lot of television production stuff in Stanford. WWE is here. I saw Amari Povich Studio, NBC, mm-hmm. Yes Network, CBS Sports HQ, which is why I'm here. What is – why – do you know why Stanford is like a hub for television stuff? Yes. So the state of Connecticut – gives production companies a tax incentive if they produce content basically within the state. And Stanford, because it's uh, location to New York, is the perfect place to ha- have all those places. Now, the only reason ESPN is in Connecticut is because a couple of guys back in the late 70s wanted to do uh, University of Connecticut sports across the state. Then they realized they could do it across the country and blah, blah, blah. But because of that, the state has given ESPN a tax incentive for years, and then they started to lure more business to the state, and that's why all the networks that are based in New York move their operations to Connecticut. Yeah, like I'm in Stanford, and I've, I've been here before, but I haven't spent much time here. 
Um, but like, it's nice and big. It seems like it's growing and it yeah. like, I, like the hotel's nice and there's a, a little mall and plenty of restaurants around. I, I don't know. I find that it, it, it's a perfectly reasonable place to spend a couple of days. Yeah, it's definitely been growing since all those networks started to migrate to the area for sure. Yeah, here's the, Connecticut is a, is a small state made up of small towns, but they're cool small towns for the most part. It is not a bad place to live by any means, except when uh, old man Winter comes knocking because he, he can be a jerk. <laughs> I'm talking to Michael Eves from ESPN. Um, Final four on the men's side is now set. We're going to get uh, UConn and Alabama, Purdue and NC State. Hey, listen, it's March Madness. We'll see what happens. But it does seem likely. In fact, it's undeniably likely. We're now headed for a UConn-Purdue National Championship game. Do you see, can you imagine Alabama or NC State getting in the way of this thing? I think NC State may have the the better chance of getting in the way than Alabama does, quite honestly, because, you know, the strength of Alabama is scoring points. And UConn can clearly do that. <laughs> uh, that's clearly been one of their strengths over the last couple of years as well. But NC State is just so intriguing, man, because they're not supposed to be there in the first place, if you really think about it, right? And I am I am interested in the matchup down low between Edie and Burns, man. That's, that's going to be very intriguing for me. I just don't think anyone can beat UConn right now. And I feel like, Gary, we, we went the entire regular season of college basketball and then into the tournaments to determine that, oh, yeah, UConn is still the best team that we thought they were when the season started, right? I felt like we just kept giving all these other teams reasons to be better than UConn. And then UConn just showed, like, no, we literally have every aspect of a championship team plus the experience of doing it the year before. They they may be Florida from 2006, 2007. At least that's where they're trending right now. They're that good. Well, what's wild is that if you look at Florida 2006, 2007, and that's our last repeat national champion, it, it looks nearly the same. I mean, it's the same starting lineup. It's the same cast of characters for the most part. And yet this is different. The three of the top six scores from last season's team are not on this season's team. And I, I, I will give folks credit who were really plugged into UConn intently early. And they would ask questions like, man, are we sure this team's not better than last season's team? And I would always just sort of be like, ah, you know, they're really good, but come on. Last season's team had two top 40 picks in the NBA draft, including a lottery pick, and that doesn't even include the most outstanding player of the Final Four. But as we sit here right now, it looks like this team is better than last season's team. They've won more games. They won a conference regular season title that last season's team didn't, a conference tournament that last season's team didn't. The computer numbers are better. Like, it, it, how wild is it that Dan Hurley had to rebuild a UConn program in one offseason and maybe built a better team than the team he won a national championship with? Right, because they're not just winning these games, Gary. They're blowing teams out as well. So the difference in their level of um, efficiency is way better than the team they're playing. So that's also a measure of how good they're playing right now. It reminds me of sort of when Kentucky went to the 1993 Final Four. They just blew out everybody through the – you know, first four games. Granted, they lost to Michigan in that semifinal game, but they were just destroying teams. That's what UConn is doing right now. And I think it's a testament to a couple of things. One, uh, Danny Hurley can coach his ass off. All right, let's just be very blunt about that. Whether it's game preparation or end game, he's just really good at what he does. He's got talent. We knew he had talent, but coming off of last year, you're like, all right, with this talent, how good can they be? Well, maybe they were better than a lot of people gave them credit for, right? And you put all that together, and they're just destroying teams. Like, look, I, I picked them to win it all just because towards the end of the season, I'm like, who's playing better than them? Nobody. Like, nobody was playing better than them the last, you know, three, four weeks of the season. Um, and with that championship experience, man, I, I just think that that matters a lot. It matters a lot because you got three other teams who've never been there. In the Elite Eight and that blowout of Illinois, that 30-0 to zero run – like having a 30 to nothing run in any basketball game is outrageous. Having it yeah. in, an, in, in, uh, in an Elite Eight game against an Illinois team that was the number two offense in America coming into the game in terms of adjusted offensive efficiency. I just did the thing where the balloons pop up on my screen again. I apologize. <laughs> I got to figure this out. <laughs> I got to figure this out. Um, to, like a 30, Illinois adjusted offensive efficiency, number two in the country coming into that game. Like it's one of the, it's the best offensive team in the country, not named UConn. And UConn went on a 30 0 run against them. Like that's, to me, that's where you go, Jesus, what are we watching here? Because that is never supposed right. to happen. No, it's not. And maybe we just need to give uh, more credit to their defense 
right? Because you can't go in a 30-0 run if you're not getting stopped at the other end. And sure, teams are going to miss shots sometimes, but there's still some defensive play there for you to go on that run. And then once you get that momentum going, then it's hard to stop. And that's, you know, Clark Kellogg loves that word, spurtability, right? Uh, that's what UConn has, probably more than any other team in the country that's playing right now, for sure. Uh, Purdue um, is the favorite in the other national semifinal. This after Zach Eady got 40 points, 16 rebounds, and a victory yesterday over Tennessee. Tennessee fans upset with the officiating. Zach Eady shot a lot of free throws, okay. was only whistled for one foul. Um, do they? It, it, is the way Zach Eady is officiated at the collegiate level an issue for college basketball? Maybe. Um, I, I wouldn't want to jump out on it and say it's not when it matters the most. I didn't necessarily feel that way. I can understand why opposing fans feel that way because they, they have emotions involved. That, that's different. But let's be honest. He is a hard player to officiate. Just the same way Shaq was back in the day. He is a hard player to officiate. And I don't know subconsciously if the officials sort of have that you know, bias or lack of bias in their mind. But again, the dude is still good, right? And usually you say that about players who are really good. Right. Like because he put up 40 and 16, people are paying way more attention to it. If he was just out there being big and had the same, you know, number of free throws and fouls, but didn't put up 40 and 16, no one would be saying anything. It's about what he does when he gets those opportunities. But again, some of that literally could just be bias. Talking to Michael Eaves from ESPN. Can you make sense of the NC State story? Like I, I've heard a lot of people try to go, well, if you think about it, and I've been thinking about it, and it, like, there's no way anybody could have predicted this, I don't believe. They had lost 10 of 14 heading into the ACC tournament, four-game losing streak heading into the ACC tournament, and now they've won nine straight games, beat Duke twice along the way, plus North Carolina, Marquette, Louisville, Syracuse, Texas Tech, Jack Golke, and now they're in the Final Four for the first time since 1983. It's a wonderful story, but like, I can't even... Like, you know, I follow this stuff every day and I, I would have, I couldn't imagine this happening. No, it doesn't make sense. It makes no. zero sense whatsoever. Um, but if you go back to their non-conference schedule, like they played some really good teams and they played really well, right? And then you get into the ACC and, you know, whatever, the regular season. Uh, but they also had some good games against North Carolina, against NC, against Duke within the regular season. And so sometimes, though, Gary, as, as we mentioned, two things happen when you get to the tournament. There is momentum and there are matchups, right? And I think for NC State, they have had the benefit of both of those things over this, what, nine-game run now between the five games of the ACC tournament and the four here in the NCAA tournament. They've just been the benefit of some really good matchups. Because you remember we go back to the term, when the tournament first started, I said if Kentucky were to get past Oakland, well, they should have, that they'd have a harder time against NC State than they would against, I think it was Texas Tech, right? Because NC State presents matchup problems for teams that they don't have time to prepare for necessarily. Now, going to the Final Four is different. you got way more time once you get to the Final Four than you do um, the second game of a weekend. But again, like, I'm interested in this matchup just because of what they can do. And now, though, look, they've never been to the Final Four, but neither has Purdue. NC State is like, we ain't supposed to be here. So anything that happens to us now, all this is gravy. Purdue was the one, number one team. They were expected to win a national championship. So all the pressure's on Purdue. So if NC State goes out there and just wilds out and Burns just does some things down low, man, like it, it, it could be very interesting. It, I'm more interested in that game than I could be the actual national championship game. Oh, we'll wrap it up here with Michael Lees. Before I let you go, I might be interested in tonight's game more than I'm interested in any men's semifinal over the weekend. And obviously, I, I, obviously Saturday's going to be great down in Arizona, but tonight could be a historically important night and perhaps the biggest night in the women in the history of women's college basketball. We get exactly what uh, I know your boss has wanted. It's Iowa, yeah, Kayla Clark, LSU, Angel Reese. Can you put into context how big this is going to be? Uh, to be fair, we'd rather have this in the Final Four than the Elite Eight. But nonetheless, <laughs> we, we did want this rematch uh, on ESPN. And the, I, I don't know if I can, Gary, because I, I don't, to your point, I don't remember a time we've had a situation as it relates to the women's game that has been to this level. Like, I mean, there was like the UConn runs back in the day, especially when the undefeated season, Rebecca Lobo kind of dethroning the Tennessee reign, but even uh, Brianna Stewart winning four straight championships and four straight MOPs. Like, th that's never been done before. But this is bigger than one program. This is all about the entire scope 
of women's college basketball. And we have superstars involved in these games. And I, I say this all the time. We are a star-driven society. That's why the popularity has been what it is, because there are legit stars out there. There's Flaw J. Johnson, there's Angel Reese, there's Caitlin Clark. Like, those ladies are making more money in NIL than most other men players on the college game, right? And, oh, by the way, the second game, we've got Paige Beckers against Juju Watkins. Like, <laughs> that's no slouch either, right? So just the overall night, you got the championship rematch, two of the biggest stars in the game, and, oh, yo, by the way, we got a pretty good game behind it as well. Like, I don't know if we've ever had this, Gary. I can't remember a time where we've had two games. And even what happens here, once we get to the Final Four, those games are going to be highly anticipated as well because South Carolina, oh, by the way, is still undefeated, and they're also trying to win another championship for Don Staley. We've never had this in women's basketball. No, it's tremendous. Tonight's doubleheader should be awesome. Final Four is going to be awesome. It's an important moment for for women's basketball and women's yes, sports is. right now. And uh, tonight is going to be uh, yeah a, a massive night. So can't wait to watch it. I appreciate you being here, buddy, and I can't wait to talk to you next week. Thank you. All right, man. Be good. All right. That's Michael Eves from ESPN. When we come back, we will keep talking college basketball because that's obviously the, the story of the day with uh, the men's final four getting set over the weekend and this massive night of women's college basketball on tap. The Kim Mulkey quote hit piece that she described that way was published this weekend in the Washington Post. Bennett, did you read it? No, I didn't get a chance to read it. Okay. It's interesting. It's, it's, it's nothing, nothing that could be reasonably described as a hit piece. It's just a, a well-reported um, profile of a of a complex figure, and I I think on some level, like it it actually humanized her a, a little bit. I know that the L.A. Times column that was in poor taste and just a, a miss. Like I know the guy who wrote it, Ben Bolch, who you know has been there for a little while. He's covered UCLA. Um, he's a good dude and a good reporter. Just every once in a while, you'll have this idea and it makes sense in your head. And then you try to put it on a computer screen and it just doesn't work and you can't see it because it made sense in your head. That seems like what happened to him. And the L.A. Times has had to apologize for that column. And Kim Mulkey, you know, used her entire postgame press conference uh, on Saturday to really go hard at it. And I think in this in this one, in this case, most of even journalists sided with her against that L.A. Times column. But it kind of overshadowed the Washington Post story that was the one everybody was looking forward to. And like I said, it's a it's just a really well done profile of a complex person. And on some level, like the bad stuff's in there, the bad stuff's in there that makes you go, "Ooh, what a she doesn't seem like the nicest person in the world or the kindest person in the world. But there's also some stuff in there that I think. I don't know. Helps explain her a little bit. We'll get into that next. Talk basketball some more. It's the Gary Paris Show. We're presented by Ortho South. Grizzlies fans know it's the team that gives you the edge. Big River Steel does too. And much like the Grizzlies have recruited legendary talent, we want you to be part of our team. Are you ready to be part of something legendary? Then visit www.bigriversteel.com. That's www.bigriversteel.com. Are you a healthcare professional looking for a new experience? Look no further than Travel Nurses Inc. Our extensive network of healthcare facilities across the country offers you the opportunity to discover new destinations while pursuing your passion. We provide competitive compensation, flexible contracts, and dedicated assistance. So join our community of nurses and allied health professionals and start your next adventure today. Visit our website at travelnursesinc.com for more information. It's more fun to be there live to see the Memphis Grizzlies hit the court all season long. From the electricity and FedEx Forum to the highlight reel plays, there's nothing quite like Grizzlies basketball. As the official marketplace of the Memphis Grizzlies, Ticketmaster gets you in with a huge selection of seats. So get off the couch and into the stands while you still can. 
Score tickets today at Ticketmaster.com. That's Ticketmaster.com. Today we have two very special guests on our program. Introducing Lem hey. and Lime. Hello. For Starry Lemon Lime Soda. Thanks for having us. What is Starry Lemon Lime Soda? It's a crisp, clear burst of lemon lime flavor. And it's caffeine free. Between us, one of you must be a little more important to Starry than the other. Who is it? We're both important. So we could just as easily be Starry Lime Lemon Soda. No, that doesn't sound right. Oh, I like it. So you saying hip hop could be hop hip. Works for me. Starry Lemon Lime Soda. Starry hits different. Orthopedic injuries can be unpredictable, unforeseen, and unscheduled. And Ortho South understands this better than anyone. Since your injuries don't make appointments, you don't need to either. And that's because Ortho South welcomes walk ins during the weekdays and the evenings and even on Saturdays. So next time an unforeseen injury makes an unscheduled appearance in your life, visit orthosouth.org to find your nearest urgent care location. Just walk in. And Ortho South will take care of everything, especially you. Learn more at orthosouth.org. That's ortho. South at orthosouth.org. Again, orthosouth at orthosouth.org. Welcome back, Gary Paris Show. We're presented by Ortho South. I'm in Stanford, Connecticut for the day, coming home tonight, 24 hours or so. Big Bet Bennett back in Memphis inside the Bill Ford Tough Studio. We've been talking basketball most of the day because uh, that's the story of the day. Men's Final Four set this weekend. Women's Final Four on the verge of getting set. Incredible doubleheader tonight with the big game, of course, being Iowa against LSU. It's a rematch of last season's national championship game. It's Angel Reese on one side, Caitlin Clark on the other. It is expected to maybe be the highest rated women's college basketball game in the history of the sport. And it will come a couple of days after uh, the Washington Post did a – Big, lengthy profile of LSU coach Kim Mulkey, which had been the talk of the sport, or at least among the conversations in the sport uh, over the past week or so, because Kim Mulkey had, um, at a recent press conference, used uh, that stage that this NCAA tournament provides to go on the attack and say that the Washington Post was working on a hit piece against her and that if they published untrue stories about her, that she would sue them. And she really went, you know, as hard as you'll ever see a sports figure go at a media publication um, in advance of a story even coming out. And I don't know why she had it in her head that this was going to be something other than what it turned out to be. Um, But what it turned out to be, I didn't interpret it as a hit piece at all, but just a a lengthy, well-reported uh, deep dive on a woman who is undeniably a complex figure who is also remarkably successful in her chosen profession. So, Bennett, I know you didn't read it. I took the time over the weekend to do it. I just felt like if I was going to spend time talking about this last week and then spend time talking about it, say, this week, I should probably at least take the time to to read it. And so I dove in and I didn't really know. I guess I, I guess I just never took the time. I didn't really know the history of Kim Mulkey, like her story. Who was she as a child? Who was she as a college basketball player? How she got in, into this business? How she ended up at Baylor? How she ended up as the head coach at, at LSU? Um, how familiar are you with just the Kim Mulkey story? Honestly, nothing but before Baylor. Right. Okay. Uh, yeah. Me neither. Me neither. So I only know about her what I have learned about her since she became famous. And she became first famous as the national championship winning coach at Baylor. And then, you know, she'll go viral every once in a while for saying some pretty outrageous stuff, at least outrageous from my perspective. You know, she is, uh, you know, I bet Kim Walkie and I sit down, have a cup of coffee. We ain't got much in common, you know. But uh, other than that, I don't know much about her. I know she hated COVID protocols and she will never wear a mask and she'll never get tested. And she's like, you know, she's that character. But outside of that, I don't really know much about her other than she's obviously really a really great basketball coach. So 
the story like dives into her childhood. And what you find out is that she comes from a family that, you know, had land out in rural Louisiana and her father like built a basketball court and softball fields and all in this land. And for much of the childhood, it appears she had a, not just a normal childhood, but like a really awesome childhood. It's like her and her sister, you know, growing up, learning how to play basketball and softball on these fields and courts that her father built. And it's her dad who is the main basketball influence on her in her life. And just like close your eyes and picture a father out there in the driveway or in the backyard with his daughters. Like that's what this story was. Like that's how, that's how she became who she became. And then at some point, when she's in college, her parents get divorced. And the relationship between Kim Mulkey and her father completely goes away. They have no relationship. They haven't spoken in 40 years. Oh, wow. The story gets into issues in the marriage that led to the divorce. I I'm never that interested in trying to talk about whose fault anybody's divorce was because you don't know anything that goes on in other people's marriages. You don't know what leads to this and what leads to this. And if this didn't happen, would this thing have happened? And oftentimes there's, there's plenty of blame to go around, but the story does seem to suggest that the cause of the demise of the marriage fell on the father okay. and Kim as her mother's daughter seemed to really struggle with this. And she, she cut her father off. She more or less said, I think you wronged my mother and therefore you can no longer be my father. And they have not spoken in 40 years. This is a man who raised this woman and like, you know, took her to college and watched her play college basketball. And once the divorce happened, it's over. And the dad is kind of sad. The dad like lives in a trailer. Kim Mulkey makes three point something million dollars wow. a year. The dad now lives in a trailer, the home that they grew up in that was like their paradise. You know, it was a modest home, but like they had land and room to run around. And daddy built a softball field over here and daddy built the basketball court over here. And it's just all gone, overrun, the house falling apart. And dad now lives in a trailer. And he said that he will still go to LSU sometimes, like sit in the top of the arena and watch his daughter coach, but he has never talked to her since since the divorce 40 years ago. That's crazy. I mean, th now it makes, in my opinion, a lot of sense as to why she tried to get in front of this thing and discredit it, because clearly the, that's probably a story she just doesn't want out there. You know what else it does? Yeah. It helps explain her. It helps explain her. Most people would not cut off their father or their mother because of anything that happened into a, in a marriage. Like those are adult issues and they're often very complicated and complex. Um, but she like drew a line in the sand and she said, you crossed it and now you're out of my life forever. And she's never budged on it. And just knowing that about her, which is why and she apparently was really upset that the Washington Post even contacted her, her father. Mm -hmm. Like she has released a statement through her attorney saying, my father has nothing to do with my career. I don't know why you're talking to him. But if you're trying to tell the story of Kim Mulkey, that story is incredibly important. Because what else do we know about this woman? That she is from a different cloth, that she's really hard-nosed, and that she doesn't seem to budge for anybody or anything, and she apologizes for nothing. And the I, like I find the whole thing sad if if it's not clear. I think it's sad that this woman and her father have no relationship whatsoever. Like I don't care what your, uh, there are exceptions to this, obviously, but with few exceptions, I think it's sad anytime a father and a son or a father and a daughter or a mother and a son or a mother and a daughter can't work through things and like at least get to a place of peace. When I hear things like Aaron Rodgers is alienated from his parents, that makes me sad. It also kind of tells me something about it, but that makes me sad. Yeah.
I don't know that you have to have the best relationship with everybody in your family, but I do think if one person is reaching out to try to make things right, if you can't find it in you to at least listen to them and hear them out, like that says something about you. And I don't, I don't know that it's a great thing about you. It's kind of a sad thing about you, but that's who she is. Like the father makes it clear to the Washington Post. I have many, many times tried to connect with my daughter, tried to talk to her, tried to explain to her. I don't believe he goes so far as to say, try to apologize to her, but he's clearly like, I would like for this to be different. And she's never given him an opportunity. She acknowledges in her book that she's published before that he has written letters and they remain unopened. She's never opened a single letter. Like, I just think that's a, it's a sad aspect of her life, but also something that maybe tells you how could she cut off Brittany Griner the way she does? Um, there's also a story in a similar sentiment. She's an assistant coach at Louisiana Tech, which is her alma mater. And um, they head coach resigns and they now need a new head coach. And the obvious thing to do was just promote her. And she wanted a five-year contract because she thought that was fair. And the school was only offering a three-year contract, the president of the university. And she was like, I want a five-year contract or I'm not taking the job. And the president was like, well, come on, let's just do three years for now. You know, we got to, you've never been a head coach before. And she, rather than accept that at her alma mater in her home state, which is on principle, she said, I told you I need a five-year contract. If you will not give it to me, I'm not taking your job. And she turned it down. She really just turned it down. And then she took a job from Baylor. And do you know, by your own acknowledgement, she has never talked to the president of that school again. Wow. Never. There's a story in the Washington Post where he has tried to congratulate her on all of her success multiple times, and she has never responded or been accepting of anything from him. There's another story about a former player who was at Baylor under Kim Mulkey and said that Kim Mulkey came to her and, and recognized that she was, she was gay. But the young woman wasn't out at the time because you couldn't be as a student at Baylor. Like that's, like Kim, like there were obviously gay players at Baylor, but you can't be public about it uh, because it runs counter to everything that school stands for. And so this young woman who was a player at the time, she says that, you know, Kim Mulkey brought her in and said, hey, you know, there's people talking like you're not as uh, behind closed doors as you'd like to think and you need to be a little more careful. And this woman goes on to explain that at some point she just decided I can't be myself at this school. I can't be myself in this community. I'm going to transfer. And she felt like um, Kim Mulkey kind of wanted her out. And she said she went through depression and a really low point in her life, feeling like she wasn't accepted. And, uh, you know, that team, she was on a national championship team before she transferred out of Baylor. And many, many years later, they decide, like you do sometimes at universities, to bring the team back. Hey, we're going to bring you all back and honor you. It's the 10 year anniversary or the 15 year anniversary or whatever, right? It's one of those deals. So, this woman who had felt isolated by Kim Mulkey and rejected by Kim Mulkey and had struggled with this for years, decided to go back to Vader. Like, hey, I know I left there under different, under like less than ideal circumstances. And I know that it was ugly and hurtful, but I was a part of that. That's a big accomplishment in my life. And I'm going to try to let the past be the past. And I'm going to go see my old teammates and my old coaches. And, you know, I'm proud of what we accomplished with that basketball team. And I'm going to go back to Waco and I'm going to, I'm going to celebrate this and, and maybe have some closure. And she tells the Washington Post, she went back to Waco and the whole team was there and Kim Mulkey was there and everybody was there. And she said she went up to Kim Mulkey at some point and, and, and like addressed, like approached her and said something along the lines of, hey, coach, it's, it's good to see you. Um, you know, just tried to. And she said Kim Mulkey didn't even look at her and walked away. Didn't say a word. All these years later, she wow. can't let anything she can't let anything go. And, and that probably has something to do with what makes her successful in her profession. 
it also seems like a miserable way to live, being unable to let anything go, carrying around resentment and, and disappointment and frustration. When people, whether it's a former player or your father or a former president that you worked for, are reaching out to you and saying, hey, let's make this right. Hey, let's get on the same page. And for her to never budge, it's an interesting personality flaw and not a good one. Um, but it also, I think, does like it's kind of sad. You know, I, I, I bet you on some level deep down like this woman is living. a. There's got to be some regret in there somewhere. Bennett, you tell me. Like, you hear what I'm telling you. This is all in that story. Um, I, I read it, and I, because the, the stuff about her shunning gay players, pr particularly working in a sport that, um, you know, working in this sport, like, that stuff's ugly and hateful and awful. And, like, it makes me think she's just as bad of a person as I thought for a while. Just, like, fundamentally not, like, not, like, there's some stuff not right in there. But the dad stuff also kind of made me feel not sorry for her, but sad for her. That's just, I, I find the whole thing to be sad. Yeah, I guess I do too. Um, uh, yeah, I, I agree with what you said. I I, I think that um, probably just from, and I, and I want to read it now after hearing you talk about it, but I think probably she just, because she puts up that wall like you talk about, that... <clears throat> She just doesn't want people learning about her life at all. You know what I mean? Like, I think that that, that it was more of... Because when, when she came out and said all that, we thought, okay, there, there's going to be some some big revelations in this, in this story about her. And in reality, I think she just didn't really want people knowing about her life because she, again, like, keeps it pretty close to the vest. Yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't know why she... I don't know why she went on the attack other than that's also in her personality. Yeah. She seems like an attacker more than the alternative, but it wasn't the story ended up not being what she suggested. She thought it was going to be when she was talking about it last week. It was just like, you know, if somebody said the biggest coaching figure in women's college basketball, at least one of them is Kim Mulkey. Um, Dawn Staley's obviously another one. Gino, there's a lot. Yeah. But but Kim Mulkey's one of them. She's a complicated character. Uh, let's go learn about her. Let's let's write the definitive Kim Mulkey profile. I thought Kent Babbitt, the Washington Post, like he set out to do it. And I thought he did a good job. It wasn't. I'm I'm sure she doesn't like everything that's in there, but that's nowhere close to a hit piece. It was just a profile on a on a complicated woman, um, and she'll be. I, I think all of that adds to tonight's intrigue. You know, sports is often about characters. Like, you know, we get games all the time. But, like, who are the characters that make you care about what's happening? And tonight you're going to have a lot of that. You know, the Angel Reese, Caitlin Clark dynamic is yeah. massive. But the Kim Mulkey, she's a character, a big character in sports now, not just women's college basketball, but sports now. So, absolutely, I would uh, suggest to anybody, if you've got the time and the interest, go read it. Because, um... I went. I, I walked away from the article with largely the same views on Kim Mulkey that I had. I, I I think she and I will probably never vote the same way in an election. I don't think she and I um, agree on much. I would not send my son or daughter to play for her or anybody like her. But I also kind of feel sorry for her because uh, there's some stuff that she's carrying around with her that I can't imagine it's healthy to to carry around. You can read it for yourself. The Washington Post website. Kent Babb was the author. It published on Saturday. We'll be back with GP's Carry Out. We know there's only one team you want to watch. And Valley Sports is the place to get your Grizzlies. Experience the comebacks, the buzzer beaters, the can't miss Memphis made moments live. Valley Sports keeps the grind going before and after the game, too, with Pete, Brevin, Fish, and Chris on Grizzlies Live. Watch Grizzlies basketball all season long with Valley Sports and streaming on the Valley Sports app. Valley Sports, home of the only team you want to watch. Now for a limited time, the new $1.99 Crispy Tender Wraps are here at Sonic. Who could deny a crispy chicken tender with bold flavors like hickory barbecue and cheesy Baja? 
And we can't forget the crisp lettuce and melty cheese to make the perfect bite. Wrap yourself up with some TLC, tender, love, and chicken for only $1.99. Sonic $1.99 Crispy Tender Wraps. Tax not included, limited time only at participating Sonic drive-ins. Grizzlies fans know it's the team that gives you the edge. Big River Steel does too. And much like the Grizzlies have recruited legendary talent, we want you to be part of our team. Are you ready to be part of something legendary? Then visit www.bigriversteel.com. That's www.bigriversteel.com. You saw with four seconds for the win. Yes! Marcus, one of the more competitive people you'll meet. He yeah, ain't lose. That willingness to go out and try to compete every day, not just wait for a game, not wait for a regular season game, not wait for a playoff game, but every day is what made Mark special. He was a big part of that identity, right? And a big part of that's why the, the team was so successful, because they had that anchor in him. The Grizzlies, to this day, wouldn't be the Grizzlies without the contribution of Marcus Gasol. Let's face it. There's a lot of trash talk in basketball, but the great teams let their performance do the talking. Like Ford F-150 with Pro Power on board, a class-exclusive industry-first feature that turns your truck into a mobile generator and leaves the competition speechless. Ford F-150, official truck of the Grizzlies. Greatness starts here at your Mid-South Ford dealer. Class is full-size pickups under 8,500 pounds, GBWR. Show presented by Ortho South. I'm in Stamford, Connecticut for the day. Ben Doyle back in Memphis. Built for Tough Studio. Ben Doyle, I should be able to see your face tomorrow. Okay, good. Like, God like in willing. person. Yep. God, God willing, like in person. I got uh, I got a, a, a direct flight home tonight to Memphis, Tennessee. And as uh, long as it takes off on time and or takes off at any time and, and lands safely, then my plan is to be in studio right there, right in the same room with you. Good. Uh, uh, tomorrow morning. It's a rarity in March or April. Oh, hey, it's April Fool's Day. Have you fallen for an April Fool's joke yet? Uh, no, I haven't. I think that we as a society have kind of, uh, and maybe I'm wrong, um, I think we've kind of, uh, this post, maybe it's, maybe it's post-pandemic, I don't know. It just feels like April Fool's has kind of lost its luster and we're, and we've matured as a society and decided we don't really need this anymore. I don't need them. I don't, I don't need them. I don't it. enjoy them. It I don't ever think you're being funny. Anymore. Yeah, I don't think you're being funny. I don't think you're being creative. You're not making me laugh. I just find it all annoying. Like I don't need April Fool's jokes. Like let's just let's just skip them. You know? Yeah. I mean, why do you know? Now, as you get older and your anxiety gets worse, like I just feel like it, it, it's. I just got no time for April Fool's Day either. Yeah. I, I don't. I don't, I don't want to feel um, uncomfortable for a few moments out of my day. Kelly got me with a good one a long, long time ago. Did she? Like, got me, like, I was really, like, freaking out. I was headed to the Final Four, so it was like this. Um, this is back when we only had one child. So this is before the other two. And um, I flew, I, I believe it was, like, San Antonio or something. I don't know. But um, I was, you know, get in the hotel, and you do what you do. You open up your bag, and you start unpacking. And there was, like, a little card, like a little present. Like, she mm -hmm. had tucked it into my bag. And, uh, you know, there was a, like a little note in there and it's like, I can't remember the details, but it's something along the lines of um, really, you know, just want to tell you how proud I am of you, how hard you're working, you blah, 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 blah. And, um, uh, you know, our, our, our growing family um, is like grateful for you. And then in there was a positive pregnancy test. Oh, that is. Yeah, that's a good one. That's a good and one. I, and I was, and I, you know, I don't even like until I just looked at my computer and saw it was April 1st, it was lost on me that today was April Fool's Day. So, um, same thing then. I didn't know what day it was. And I'm like, oh my God, are you kidding me? We're about to have another baby now. And I, and she like played it out for, you know, I call immediately 
And she like played. She hung on to it for five minutes or so before finally busting up and telling me it was an April Fool's joke. But like I was actually like she got me. I didn't like see that and go, oh, it's April Fool's. How stupid. Like I, I thought I was having another child. So I guess that's an effect of April Fool's joke, but I could do without them. Yeah, you know, I actually, I take back what I said. I like dishing out April Fool's Day jokes. I don't like, want to be the butt of one. I don't I don't want you doing April Fool's jokes to me. I want to be the one giving them out. That's, yeah, that's, where, I, I, that's where I stand on April Fool's Day. And I don't need to see them on Twitter. You know, can we just keep them off Twitter? Like, uh, breaking yeah, those news. Are lame. Breaking news, Tom Brady is unretired and is going to quarterback the Titans next year. Like, you know, I don't need that on April mm -hmm. Fool's Day. I am you know? going to pass. But, yeah, I'm, happy April Fool's Day to everybody. Yeah, happy April Fool's Day, guys. But, like, but like calm down. We're, we, like, we should be over that at this point. Let's do GP's carryout. It's time for GP's carryout. One final segment filled with stuff to take with you. It's not everything you need to know, but it's most of it. What did we learn today? whole bunch of stuff, but we mostly focused on the NCAA tournament because the Final Four is now set. Going to be Purdue and NC State, Alabama and UConn, with the Huskies and Boulder both significant favorites in the national semifinals. Obviously, NC State is the surprise team here, or at least the biggest surprise team here, an 11 seed. It really is a remarkable story. I was on CBS Sports HQ last night. And Team Dermish was like, the GP, how do you make sense of NC State? You don't make sense of it. There's nothing, there's nothing you could point to that suggests we should have or anybody sh should have seen this coming. Um, it's one of the things that is consistently true about this event. Is that if you are ever expecting it to go as planned, just know that it almost never does. The issue is trying to figure out where the madness is going to happen because there's no rhyme or reason to it. Mm -hmm. You can just sort of assume it's going to happen somewhere, but you don't know where. It's like if somebody told you, hey, in this 50-mile, 100-mile radius, it is going to thunderstorm like crazy at noon tomorrow, but I can't tell you where. You try to figure out where, but there's absolutely nothing that will lead you in the right direction, but just know it's coming. You have no idea where. That's what the NCAA tournament is. Mm -hmm. You know that the madness is coming. You just don't know where it's going to be. And in this case, it happened to be in the West region with North Carolina State. This team finished two games below 500 in the ACC. This team lost 10 of its final 14 regular season games, including the last four heading into the ACC tournament. And then they won five games in five days to get an automatic bid to the NCAA tournament. And now they have won four games in this NCAA tournament to advance to the Final Four. And they beat their in-state rival, the Duke Blue Devils, in the Elite Eight to do it. Do you realize, I think most people do at this point, that even in the ACC tournament against Virginia, they were on the rope and like a free throw away of being eliminated their season over. There was 5.3 seconds remaining in an ACC tournament game against Virginia. If NC State loses it, they do not go to the NCAA tournament. Isaac McNeely's at the free throw line for Virginia. He's an 84.7% free throw shooter. He's got a one on one. Virginia's up three. If this 85% free throw shooter makes a free throw, it's a four point game. It's over. Virginia advances. NC State season is over. He missed it. Virginia didn't foul. Up three. And then Michael O'Connell banks in a three pointer to force overtime. NC State wins in overtime. And the rest, as they say, is history. But that's how thin the margins were. If Isaac McNeely makes a free throw as an 85% free throw shooter, NC State season is over right then. He missed it. Now here we are. DJ Burns has become the face and body oh, of this NCAA yeah. tournament. You love DJ Burns. Everybody oh, loves man. DJ Burns. Him, him versus Zach Eady, that's a fun storyline. It's fun. I think I think he'll end up on the wrong end of that. I got it, but it's still like you've got like this – this guy that's just become a fan favorite and he's going up against the juggernaut, right? And it's a, that one-on-one -on -one matchup. It's kind of a fun storyline. It, it's wild. Like, I have to write about college basketball every morning of the season. I host a college basketball podcast 12 months a year. We do multiple episodes each week in the off season, at least three episodes per week during the season. 
Not one time this season that we talk about Jack Volkey or DJ Burns, and they have become the two stars of this NCAA tournament. We barely talked about NC State for more than 45 seconds on the podcast all season long. They just were an irrelevant ACC program with a coach on the hot seat. Nothing more, nothing less. And now they're in the Final Four, and DJ Burns is like the face of it. Oh, by the way, he's another thing. People are like, man, where's DJ Burns been all season? He's been averaging 12.4 points per game for a 10th place team in the ACC. He's got, like, he had 29 points last night against Duke. He had 24, two games to go against Marquette. In the regular season, DJ Burns scored more than 20 points one time. One time the entire yeah. regular season. He's done it twice in the past three games. So he's out of nowhere. NC State's out of nowhere. Kevin Keats goes from maybe getting fired if they lose in the ACC tournament to now he's got a contract extension and he's a Final Four coach. So this is the type of thing that the NCAA tournament can give us. It doesn't always, but it always can. And not every other postseason event can do this. Like, college football playoff, an NC State and a DJ Burns can't sniff that. Major League Baseball playoffs, an NC State caliber team wouldn't be in it. NBA playoffs, an NCAA, uh, an NC State caliber team wouldn't be in it. But because of the nature of the 68 team field and automatic bids and conference tournaments, there's always a path for something like this to happen. And when it does, um, it never makes any sense, but it is fun to watch. What's today's biggest game? We'll go Elite Eight. Women's NCAA tournament. Oh, thank goodness. Iowa LSU, 6 o'clock, MVP Arena, Albany, New York. It's a rematch of the title game of the 2023 NCAA tournament. You can watch it on the ESPN. Iowa minus one and a half. Total is 168.5. And Bennett, my God, you're still stuck on 99. I know. And listen, I thought you were going to give me Grizz Pistons, and I was like, I don't know what to do with that. <laughs> Grizz Pistons, I didn't want anything to do with that game tonight because I think it's right now it's Pistons minus one and a half. And I just, How are we going to talk to the Pistons? Dude, Christ. because I, did you see the Magic? I know you didn't because you were busy, but the Orlando Magic game this weekend, I mean – I, I got to call it like it is. Like they just they there was they didn't really show up for that game. Um and so I don't really know like where we're at as far as like what we're trying cuz now you're in like positioning season, right? Like you're 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 definitely in draft positioning season and this is the biggest game of the night as far as draft positioning and so I don't know what either of these teams want to do. That's why I didn't want anything to do with the game. Pistons minus one and a half. It's a 6 o'clock tip up at Little Caesars Arena. Yeah, Desmond Bain's out tonight. He's still out with back soreness. Looks like Kennard's doubtful. Um, Santi's questionable. I guess Jaron will play tonight. But, like I said, I don't know what to do with that one. Do we know if any of the Grizzlies were at that Purdue-Tennessee game yesterday? I'm not like, sure. Because you know, um, that's like, you know, same arena. One day after Zach Eady and Dalton Connect grace the floor inside Little Caesars Arena, it'll be... Somebody for the Grizzlies and somebody for the Pistons. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, okay, okay, LSU-Iowa. Um, I'm fired up for this game, actually. And it's awesome. I'm happy for them that it kind of fell on Monday night because everyone still got, like, just buzzing about the college basketball weekend. So I think they'll do a huge number tonight. Um, it's, and it's, like, the only real big game on tonight. Um, so I think the Hawkeyes get revenge. I think I think the Hawkeyes get revenge. I'm gonna go with them. You're 99, 108, and four. You're now negative 20.8 units. This is an all-time low for you. Really bad. Um, really bad. Yeah, really bad. I, I don't know. I don't know what to say. I don't know what to do. Um, I've just I've kind of just blocked it out a little bit. If I'm being quite honest with you, <laughs> it's just kind of it's just kind of sitting there. Um, well, I hope I hope tonight goes well for you. If it goes well for you, it'll also go well for Caitlin Clark. Is that where we're at? I'm not going to try to turn this into a good versus bad. That's what the LA Times tried to do. And yeah, we're not doing that. Then they had to apologize for it. So I'm not trying to do that at all. But, but this is true, isn't it? Can we just can we just say these two things are true? Broadly speaking, people do love Caitlin Clark. And broadly speaking, people don't love Kim Mulkey. So I imagine most of America's probably rooting for Iowa. Not because they're good and LSU's bad, but because like uh 
People don't love Kim Mulkey. So you'd like to see Kim Mulkey lose and you'd like to see Caitlin Clark win. I think that's where most of America is. I'm not speaking for myself, Bennett, but most of America, I think if we put a poll up, most of America would like to see Iowa win this game, don't you think? Uh, I don't know, man. I think people like that LSU team. I, I agree like that it. like the coaches, like the, you know, the, the, when, when you're talking college sports, like the coach is the main figure. But I do think people like that team i think they like angel reese i think they like, I like uh, angel reese. yeah what's uh what's the point guard's name haley um i think they li i think people like that team so i okay yeah i i think you're i think you might be wrong on this i think it's more split okay. i think it's okay. more split uh, hey i'm just gonna be neutral then i'll just watch it from a neutral perspective iowa lsu tonight six o'clock espn bennett says take caitlin clark and the hawkeyes what are we watching on tv I'll be on TV again here in a minute. You're going to watch me on TV? 1 o'clock on CBS Sports Network. We'll be taking the Eye on College Basketball podcast to TV once again. So that's 1 o'clock CBS Sports Network, 1 o'clock Central, 2 o'clock Eastern. And then tonight, we get Raw. The last Raw before WrestleMania. Yeah, buddy. You hey, saw who's going to be in the building tonight. Roman Reigns, The Rock, both going to be at Barclays Center tonight in Brooklyn. I should have just stayed the night in New York. You Went should have, man. Tonight. It's going to be a good Raw, I feel like. It's going to be a good SmackDown was I, – I was. I think I was right on SmackDown. It was not a great show. Oh, it was when, terrible. Yeah, it was not a great show. I just I, – it felt like a. It, it felt like one of those shows where there was so much going on in sports this weekend, and WWE was just like, eh, we don't, we don't need this one. We got a good WrestleMania on tap. We don't, we don't need this one. I don't know what they were doing, but yes, yeah. SmackDown was not, not great on Friday, but tonight should be wonderful. One day after the King, LeBron James was inside Barclays Center. The Rock and the Tribal Chief will be inside Barclays Center. That's tonight. Get USA, that put, your, up. put your one up. Give me some confetti. Give, give me some confetti for my tribal I'm chief. I'm crying. <laughs> give me it? some confetti for my tribal chief. We need good vibes going into mania. There we go. There we go. Tribal chief in the rock. Seven o'clock. USA Network. What's the best thing we've read? I think it's the Kim Babb story on Kim Mulkey in the Washington Post. Much anticipated story. It dropped Saturday. It was not a hit piece, which is what Kim Mulkey predicted. It was just an in-depth profile on a complex and com complicated sports figure like Kim Mulkey. So uh, I did think the way it ends um, it was very deliberate, which is, you know, the ending of any big profile like that should be deliberate. But, like, if you go read the last graph the last sentence it's like and then you know he's setting a scene and then it's like and then kim mulkey walked out alone i like i believe the last word in the story is alone and it's sort of it that's that symbolic of her life like she is oh I, I didn't even mention this she's also alienated from her sister like she doesn't talk to her sister she doesn't talk to her father i just like i don't think you got to be best friends with everybody but like you know how about this? Is there anybody today, Bennett, anybody in your life? And it, 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 I don't mean to just, just say no if, if you don't care about answering it. Is there anybody in your life who could reach out to you today? Even somebody who had wronged you once upon a time and you would just reject them offhand, just reject them out of hand. You'd just be like, no, I would, I'd have no interest even hearing what you have to say about anything. No, not that I can I, think see, of. Not I don't that I can think, think I do of. Either. I don't think I do either. Like I think I could be open minded with anybody. At least not I, any not any important figures in my life. Right. Yeah. Right. There there'll be people I won't ever talk to again just because I don't care. Right. Right? Just cause like, yeah, I don't need to ever talk to that person again. But like if there was somebody I was once close with and they wanted to reach out and clear the air or find some closure or anything. I would be recept I, I would be receptive to that. Yeah. And I think if you're not receptive to that, it says something about you. And I don't think it's a good thing. So um for to find out that Kim Mulkey's got a lot of that stuff in her life where she just cuts people off and it's no looking back. Um per perhaps it makes her, like I said earlier, successful in her professional life, but I can't imagine that's healthy in a in a personal life. Go uh go read it when you get a chance. Washington Post website. What's on tap for tomorrow? Well, it'll be Tuesday. We'll look back at this big Grizzlies Pistons tilt. 
Yeah, we'll have, we will. We'll break we'll have, it all down for you. We'll break it all down for you. We'll have uh, incredible women's basketball games to to recap. So it should be a fun day. Looking forward to it already. Enjoy the rest of your day. I'm going to enjoy mine. We will meet back here tomorrow at 10. Till then, be careful, be kind, be good. Rep your hood. <laughs>